John Lazar, Daniela Robu, Dr. Tony Marker and I have known each other through ISPI and ISPI EMEA for years. This conversation started as a chat about how performance gaps travel in packs. Their causes are typically multiple and they interact too. That means OPAL practitioners need to create systems comprised of interacting components to close performance gaps. But enough said, our webinar hosts today will say this far more elegantly than I. John and Daniela, we're delighted to have you with us today. Hello, all Hello. thank you. Pleasure to be with you all. Uh, Tony and Steve, thank you so much for the invitation that you extended to us and for the uh, professional camaraderie we've shared over the years. I think it's been uh, extraordinarily instructive for me as somebody who is more self-taught than formally edu educated in, in HPT. Let me lay things out in terms of what we're going to be doing uh, this evening and next week, and then we'll jump into it. So we have two parts to the series on blended solutions. Um, the first part is this evening. It's on a systemic approach. And what Daniela and I try to do is to lay out uh, an approach to dealing with multiple root causes and, so, and solving performance problems and um, the implications that go along with that. Uh, next week, Daniela will be in the lead and she'll be um, sharing with you a case study that is in fact a real case study um, and uh, a project that she is still working on at six or seven years into it um, at her home from her home office and um, her home organization, Alberta Health Services. So you get a high level view this evening, you get a case study um, next week. And we hope that between the two of them and the conversations that are generated, some, some interesting, provocative um, perspectives and insights emerge. Danielle, is there anything that you'd like to add before we uh, move forward? Oh, just thank, to, thank Tony and Steve for the invite and opportunity to share all that um, we have re related to blended solution to the ones on, on the call. So thank you. And Very good. Thank you. I, you. I think, go ahead. No, ready for you. Okay. The, on. the only other the only other thing I would say because clearly people are are are, are finding themselves in the question of, of accents. So it's true my accent is from Chicago. And and yeah. it's true my accent is from Romania. I Ah <laughs> I see I thought that was obvious, but okay. Yes. So I came to, to Canada eighteen years ago. And they're glad to have you. Um, by the way, all of you will have access to the handouts uh, PDFs that I believe Steve will put the, uh, the link for that access in the, uh, in the chat. Is that correct, Steve? Yes, they're in the Perfect. chat window. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, but enough about us. So here's what our agenda is this evening. There's some context setting some key concepts that are gonna lay the foundation for, uh, for the heart of the matter, which is a blended solution approach and some lessons. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a piece of work that Daniela and I did with a colleague initially for an EMEA conference in Bologna, Italy in 2017. And so as, as Daniela and our colleague Edie and I were trying to think about how to talk about this and how to make this notion of blended solution a little bit more accessible. Um, what I came up with was um, something that you'll see in the next slide. Right now here you get to see what, what our objectives are. It's about, it's about mapping root cause root cause classes. It's about what it takes to formulate a blended solution, um, when a team approach might make sense, and um, the issue of selling, because we're always selling, whether we realize it or not. We're always in sell mode, what we're selling and to whom, 
matters and how we go about it matters and we'll deal with that too. So setting the context, many years ago, um, my family took a vacation together. It was a long time ago. It was when my older brother was 12. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even want to think about that. It was a long time ago. Um, and since we'd never been on a vacation together before, um, mom and dad were thinking about, well, where are we going to go and what are we going to do and how can we do it so that we can actually have a happy vacation together as a family. Um, and in my own mind's eye, I did some imagining in terms of the kind of thinking that mom and dad might have gone through and the kinds of things that they might have considered in figuring out where to go, what kinds of activities we might, we might do, and so on and so forth. So in my, in my wild imagining, uh, with the family as the organizational unit, there was some kind of organizational analysis that they did. There was some kind of environmental analysis that they did. And those things taken together with other, thing, with other aspects that were less well formulated uh, gave them some kind of a picture and some kind of an understanding of the system, the performance system, with which they were working, AKA the family. And what they, what they saw was that um, there was a gap between, their design, between what they wanted, which was to have this great vacation together as a first example of the family coming together and, and traveling together and vacating together. And uh, what, was likely, what was likely to happen that it was going to be difficult to please everybody equally or sufficiently. Now, again, in my wild imaginings, the, my folks could look, look a little bit further and, and use some different categories as a way of better understanding what might be at the heart of what this gap was seeming to indicate. So if they were, if they were looking for at specific data information, what kinds of things were they considering? If they were looking for tools and resources and environmental supports. What were they looking at? So on and so forth. Um, is, does anybody recognize these categories? And, and so if you can come off mark or, or, or put something in the chat um, as to what, what these categories relate to from a, mo from a model standpoint. And um, Daniela, if you would take a look if, if somebody happens to throw up a flare and give an answer. Um, you yes, can read I will it. follow. Pardon me? I will follow. Yes, we, uh, we have people recognizing HPT. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great. And we sure. have some questions as well, question mark type of thing. Okay. Uh, even quite well, ISP performance model, one team, yeah, our yeah. model of performance improvement. So, um, it's recognized, sure. John. The model is recognized. <laughs> that, that's great. And, and this, this root cause piece comes from Tom Gilbert's behavioral engineering model. It's in a different format than what you would typically see, which is six boxes. But um, it's, looking, it's looking at um, what are the factors that contribute to worthy performance or get in the way of. And out of this, um, mom and dad had to think about, okay, so given our understanding of things, what might we do? How might we deal with this? And then on the right-hand side, you see intervention options uh, as a way of how they could set, the, set the, this first trip up um, in a way that was likely or more likely to produce a happy vacation together with the family. Now, if I have to tell you in all honesty, in recent conversations with my sister, I've come to find out that she didn't have a really good time on the vacation. What are you going to do? Um, but you can see in this kind of systemic and systematic approach that there's a way that we can go about understanding um, our world, understanding the context 
and using that as a basis for going, okay, um, how do we want to move forward? How do we understand why we're even in a conversation with the, with the client? And what are we going to do about that? And what, is that, what does that mean? What are the implications? So let's look at that. Oh my God, HPT model. You're right. So here we have in, in quite a cleaned up form, um, Van Team Mosley and Dessinger's um, HPT model. And you can see we have the same kinds of elements there that we had before. We have an organizational and an environmental analysis. We have a gap analysis. We have root cause analysis. Um, and then we have a number of different possible interventions that we can select from and design for and develop for. And then ultimately, um, as you see in that box towards the right, um, there's a business case to be made, which is to say, this is that selling piece of the conversation that um, you, have to sell, you have to sell your solution to whoever your decision makers are. And you have to get ownership from whoever your key stakeholders are, it's because you're going to want their you're going to want their support along the way. Um, given that, then we we implement the solution, and then we are, we are evaluating along the way, and then uh, depending on the nature of the solution, if it's something that's ongoing, then we need to. Move <clears throat> If it isn't, then we bring that to completion and do our um, summative evaluation. Erica Gilmore, um, a colleague of Daniela and Steve and Tony's and mine, a woman by the name of Judy Hale, who is an institution within the ISPI community, um, a number of years ago shared with me that she sat on the doctoral committee at Erica Gilmore um, at Indiana University. And the, the curious, interesting thing to me about this was that Erica's research was looking at uh, Weil's taxonomy and taking a look at what the relationship was between performance problems, root causes, and solutions. And as you can see in terms of a key finding, uh, what I excerpted, from her, from her dissertation, on average, for every three categories identified as issues or red causes, performance and for an employment improvement solution, there are interventions uh, developed in at least four different categories to affect the desired change. So she's saying in her in her doctoral research, and she had somewhere between a dozen and fifteen different performance interventions that she that she was examining and looking more closely at. On average, anytime, anytime there was an issue for, a perform, for, for, performance problem, for performance improvement, there was at least three red causes. So to Steve's point of um, problems come in bunches or red causes come in bunches, and at least four different, so, di four different um, solutions. So I, I found myself immensely curious and excited by this because it, it underscored two different things for me. The first was that it, it provided some empirical support for the, for the felt experience that I had, that there was more going on than just one red cause and, and for which um, one solution was going to suffice. It says, no, if you look a little bit further, if you don't stop prematurely, you may very well find that there's more going on that warrants closer scrutiny. Second, it made the case that if on average there are four different uh, solution categories to affect the desired changes, that means if what you focus on is only one category, training, for example, or job redesign, or whatever it might be, that it's highly likely that you're leaving impact and value and money 
on the table. So I'm going, oh, okay. That's something I can use. That's something I want to be attentive to. I need to be, I need to be a more awake practitioner when I'm doing this kind of work. So I'm not simply running away, letting my assumptions run away with me. I'm doing the analytical work, at least enough of the analytical work that I can find out what else may be going on. In fact, I just, I just finished writing a uh, case study chapter on leadership coaching. Coaching is what I tend to do is the large part of my, my, my business work. Um, that also is dealing with multiple root causes. So this piece is central uh, to our conversation today. And it's also gonna be central as you'll see next week to what uh, Danielle is gonna be sharing with us about her case study. So we talked about root cause classes. And again, um, we have Tom Gilbert and his behavioral engineering model. And these are the six categories. These are the labels for those six categories in the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we have, well, what are examples intervention-wise? What goes with what? So you can see that um, there's different, different interventions are associated with different root cause classes. There isn't anything where one size or one intervention fits all. So if I didn't, if I hadn't made the argument um, sufficiently strongly before about um, not putting too much hope in one intervention, this ought to make that abundantly clear, is that there's a lot going on, or said differently, there's a lot that needs to be going on in order for people to perform, perform well, perform consistently. Um, Daniela, let me, let me stop here and just ask what questions, comments, or anything you, you may have come in since we got started that might be worth taking a moment to respond to. Um, we have no questions, but uh, probably it's a moment when uh, a question can be asked. Okay. So we will, we will move on, and as questions come up, we'll deal with them in kind. Okay, we have a statement from Tony. Um, three root causes is an eye opener for me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You get it's like there's different flavors of stuff going on. It's like what contributes to what? And there's stuff going on with individual with the individual performer, there's stuff going on in the performance environment. The more you have present, the more you have things aligned the more likely it is you're going to get the, the performance at the level that you're looking, that you're looking to, to, uh, to produce and have that be reliably present. Anything else before I move on, Dee? Well, there we go. So we've talked about root cause classes, we've talked about interventions, and has, uh, as Steve indicated, we can, we can think about in individual interventions. As a matter of fact, my hunch is that's what most of us tend to do, is to, um, is to think about interventions by themselves, a single intervention as an elegant way of um, impacting and improving performance. What Gilmore's research is telling us is that there may be more than one intervention that's appropriate. There may be more than one intervention that um, needs to be considered and when considered may need to be um, designed to be implemented um, in a holistic, synergistic, integrated way. And what we call that is BS. I mean, what we call that is a blended solution the acronym for which is BS. So you have this set of individual interventions, said blended or simple, combination, when holistically, synergistically integrated, implemented form a blended solution. 
And there are a couple of different categories, a couple of different ways to identify or distinguish what a blended solution is. So you have two or more of these interventions that are integrated, interdependent, synergistic. They, they address the same root causes, um, mostly redundantly. So there, there's overlap, there's reinforcement, however you want to think about that. Um, as I was talking before about the notion of alignment, um, since you need to sell and the more interventions you have, the more likely it is that you're going to be Im impacting multiple individuals within the same organization, which means you've got multiple people or stakeholders who are going to be impacted by your intervention. You need to sell them on what, the, what it is that you're taking on and align them so that they provide the support that needs to go along with the work that's there to do. Requires both qualitative and quantitative measures uh, as a way of measuring effectiveness. Um, and it requires uh, faith, courage, and a word that I can't even read right there because Victor's, Victor's name is over it. Stretch. Uh, thank you, stretch. So clearly I, my, my vision wasn't able to stretch, and Victor, no, that's not a, not a slam on you. Faith, courage, and stretch. So in other words, um, if we're gonna go this route, we're, we're, need gonna, we're gonna, by definition, we're playing a bigger game. It's gonna stretch us, it's likely to stretch um, those in the organization who are going to be affected by our blended solution. And so, we want to be able to keep the faith, be courageous, and allow ourselves to stretch in the pursuit of what's going to make a difference and um, provide satisfaction and add value for our organization and our organizational clients. I'm being mesmerized by, oh, there it is. Okay. So one of the um, approaches that one can take as a way of trying to figure out, well, if we've got multiple things going on, we've got multiple root causes, we've got, we've got multiple um, interventions that we're considering, how do we go about sorting out which, are, which makes the most sense in terms of what intervention or interventions to put together? Maybe for any of a number of different reasons, we can't um, do everything. Matter of fact, most of the time, we can't do everything. So we have, to, we have to prioritize. On what basis do we prioritize? And this is what you see here, this uh, effort benefit matrix is something that our colleagues at Baxter, uh, Tim Gillum and Kerry Mortensen put together uh, in which you're going to rate um, relative benefit, relative effort, and then plot things in the way that you kind of see here and then make decisions based on what the constellation of root causes is that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to impact and the interventions that you're potentially choosing amongst, um, which ones seem, tend to fall into that high benefit, relatively low effort. Uh, Daniela, a question for you, can you read can you read what's on the right hand side with it without without um of course if you would please yeah so um when hp technologies use a variety of interventions to meet a performance need they must logically integrate the interventions integration is required for maximum effectiveness and efficiency on behalf of performance in their organizations if you don't have expertise or interest in designing, delivery, uh, delivering variety of interventions, consider forming a team to do the work, which is very important. Thank you. So, so and you may recall that one of the objectives had to do with um, when, when might it make sense to form a team? This last little paragraph is probably, the, in my view, the number one rationale for forming a team. You don't have the expertise, you don't have the interest, but something more is being demanded of you. Get some, get some colleagues together who bring the skills, knowledge, 
attitude, competency to do the work, create your team and make it happen that way. Let me just stop and ask if there's any, if there's any questions at this point or any comments at this point. Okay, uh, so one second. Steve, um, he says, Mickey Lane, a former SPA president, once characterized performance improvement practitioners as integrators, led walking and teaming to create integrated solutions supports this. Yep. Yeah, Mickey is one of the ISPI gurus. And I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, in, in the systemic and systematic work that we're asked to do, as performance technologists or performance improvement specialists, whatever, the, whatever that language is, um, we need to be able to draw broadly on, um, on the extra expertise from across a, a bunch of different disciplines. It's very seldom the case that we within us is housed all of that expertise, all of that experience. Forming a team means that you expand the pool of capacity and capability that you have and also expands the possibility of, of the size of the offers that you're able to make and fulfill on. So teaming on different projects can be a, a very, very smart move. Let's see what else we have. Stakeholders. So the first, the first statement is like, so what's a stakeholder? Anybody who can affect or be affected by an organization strategy or project. Stakeholder care has to do with what? The care and feeding or the tending to take care of your stakeholders, soliciting opinions and perspectives, why it's important, why what matters is important, what success would look like, um, and then including that or considering that seriously in the design of the intervention and your evaluation. Why, so my question to you all is with respect to the stakeholder care, why is this important? Why do we wanna be actively engaged in this? And if you want, you can think customer as one stakeholder, but there's others too, but why does it matter? Daniela, what do you, what do you got? I'm okay. Um, Anthony says to learn about the entire system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and as, we, as we learn about the entire system and we take that into consideration in what we propose in our business case to sell to the organization, whether we're internal or external, if we do a good job of having listened, if we do a good job of the data gathering that, uh, that we need to do when we do our analyses, if we do a good job of our analysis, of our translating that into, into uh, design considerations and a set of interventions, perhaps a blended solution for them. Yeah. So we do have um, another statement from uh, Steve. If you yeah. don't satisfy your stakeholders, they aren't going to want to play with you. Mm. And um, that's very true. And in Gu Gang, um, mm -hmm. he says, I'm a big fan of blended intervention as a performance terrorist, uh, a theorist. Uh, on, on the, <laughs> it, it, it goes very well the other I, I, way. I think a performance terrorist is about right absolutely <laughs> in order to get that done um, on the other hand I'm feeling that uh, there is a limitation on this approach blended or comprehensive interventions the assumption is that blended or comprehensive interventions will apply to the entire sample population we might need to develop optimized interventions of subgroups in mm -hmm. the entire population, sample population. Yeah. By, by the way, th that's a great point. Do you, do you know what that's called? A blended solution. I could, I could, I could understand. I, I think the point, what you're pointing at is you, you, you're not talking about one intervention that's going to work equally well for everybody. There may be further differentiation with respect to different subpopulations. Makes 
perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And and if and if you if you do that, and you do it in a systematic, integrated, synergistic way, that's called a blended solutions. And not everything require necessarily requires a blended solution. Let's be clear about that. But oftentimes it isn't even considered or isn't even visible. Thus, the the series that Daniela and I are doing this week and next. Uh, and and Victor um, is saying that taking um, your sister as a subgroup, this may have improved <laughs> her vacation experience. <laughs> if if mom and dad. If, well, this is another example. If I only knew then what I know now. Um, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Clearly, there, uh, there's, something, there's something called instrumentation bias uh, that Tony and Steve can talk to you guys about if, you have, if they haven't already. And it may very well be that mom and dad were biased more about what the boys wanted than what my sister Joni wanted. Um, I don't know that for sure, and it's too late to go back and do some further uh, data gathering. Uh, so the, 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 the other answer, or an, another answer to the question uh, that, I'm, that I'm posing is what the implication, what you see in that third paragraph, what the implications for the project are. That uh, not all stakeholders are, are created equal. Not all stakeholders' opinions matter exactly the same. Some stakeholders, they are in fact the designated organizational customer, decision maker, um, for whether or not they're gonna say yes to what it is that you're proposing in your business case. So you certainly want to include them. They are your customers. And by the way, their satisfaction matters because anytime they are saying yes to you, they are taking a risk. Anytime they say yes to you, they are putting some aspect of their own professional identity at risk by endorsing and supporting what it is that you're proposing. So the care and feeding of stakeholders becomes important. Uh, Danielle, is there anything that you would, that you would add to that given, given the the vast kind of experience that you have in doing this kind of work? I would only add that um, it really matters uh, the stakeholder engagement at every moment um, of the journey, depending on whatever project you have. Um, it's not once that you are doing that, you have to do that continuously uh, and it affects the project, it affects the implementation of it in, um, in operations, post implementation as well. So um, I think that's one of the key elements of being sure it's a continuous stakeholder engagement. So that stakeholder engagement, stakeholder management is, is critical. And uh, next week, when Daniela shares with us um, her case study, You'll, you'll have an opportunity to hear about that and see some of that in action over, over, the, over a span of uh, several years that this project has been uh, in gear. And evaluation. So again, given, given uh, the HPT model, evaluation is an essential part. And uh, you see several different, several different statements um, the ones in quotes are, are from Ingrid Guerra Lopez, one of her books on evaluation, um, in terms of what, evalu what evaluation delivers on or produces, action plans for improving programs and solutions, uh, systematic framework, um, allows you, depending on the kind of evaluation that you're doing, uh, to compare results with expectations, finds drivers and barriers, um, so all of this is like when we put that evaluative hat on what becomes visible and available for us for, to take into account and consider. And uh, Danielle, if you would read on the right hand side, the one for, uh, for, the, for stakeholder per end customer. Uh, the satisfaction, stakeholder satisfaction meets, exceeds conditions of satisfaction and value for the uh, designated stakeholders 
for customers, for process and outcome. Thank you. So when we talk about, so this is something, um, and, I, and perhaps when we have question and answer, I'd be curious, Tony, Steve, and your point of view, as well as, as others who are here on, on the call with us, that um, within some of the models that I use, when I think about customer satisfaction, the two main things that, that, are, that contribute to that, one, one is that they declare that their conditions of satisfaction have been met, whatever those are. Those may be process related uh, conditions of satisfaction, those may be outcome related or both. And in their terms, that they have gotten at least sufficient value out of what was delivered, out of what was produced, that they, they feel that they've, they can justify to themselves and potentially others what came out of saying yes to this piece of work. Was there, was there a comment? Uh, I'm seeing some, yes, some things uh, happening. Anthony, What's going on? Anthony mentions that uh, client determines value, not us. That, that's an incredibly important point. And it's counterintuitive, I think. I think uh, more often than not, uh, we have the belief that we are the arbiter and the declarer of value. We're offering it, aren't we? It must be valuable. Uh, and Tony's got it right. It's always, it's always in, in the eye of your customer. They're the ones who get to say, not us. We get to listen well and, and make adjustments and navigate well. Anything else before we go on? We can go on. Okay. So here's, here's a little bit less than a baker, half dozen of lessons learned. Um, we have, there's always performance issues in organizations. There's never, there's never a lack of performance issues. The question is whether it's worth the while of decision makers to do something about them rather than continue as business as usual. So when it comes to, to uh, looking at making sense of and creating a story about why a particular performance issue might be worth going after, you're, um, as, as the proponent of that, you're always dealing with two, two things. Number one is other, other choices that decision makers have for where to apply scarce resources. And the second is the relative virtue or benefit of doing what it is that you're proposing versus doing nothing different. Those two conditions are always at play. Our clients can always say, our customers can always say, nah, not now, not important enough. Nah, not now. Doesn't seem to be a large enough projected return on investment for that. No, nah, not now. That seems to really be a pain in the butt and so on. So we want to be looking for those things that are going to make a difference and that are going to stand out uh, from more run-of-the-mill projects. And we have, to be, we have to be thoughtful about that. Second, um, because what it is about blended solutions, because they're integrated, because they're synergistic, they, which means they build on each other, a blended solution will tend to deliver superior results. As we've talked about before, multiple interventions require selling to multiple stakeholders. You can't assume that what the conditions of satisfaction are for one stakeholder will be the conditions of satisfaction for another. In fact, um, in the example that one of you was talking about, where you, we use my sister as a subgroup or something else, you know, her conditions of satisfaction were clearly different than what my brother Jeffrey or I wanted and what my mom and dad ultimately decided on in terms of not so much where we were gonna go, but what we were gonna do. As, as we said, and as uh, Daniela reiterated, selling happens when you sell your proposal, when you implement your project, when you develop ongoing sustainable support. And finally, um, where and how do you wanna play? If you're gonna play on a project, 
um, are you up for, for the different roles that are there for you to take on? If you are, great. And if you are and you can do great work, great. If not, given what's demanded, form a team. Make it happen that way. It's a quarter of now, and Danielle and I wanted to open it up for, for question and answer. What you have in your handout when you, when you access it and download it is an example of a blended solution that uh, our colleague Edie used when we talked about the work that she was doing uh, in, in Bologna, information about blended solution in, in the application of this particular blended solution. Um, that HPT model for this particular uh, intervention and then references. So let me come back up and um, I'm open for, for both of us to uh, answer questions, um, not through the chat, but, but in conversation, Steve, if that, if that works for you and Danielle, if that works for you. Yes, of course. Steve uh, also posted in, in the chat that Blended Solutions also require effective client sponsorship to support the collaboration required to create integrated solutions. And Absol absolutely. And gaining sponsorship requires practitioners to align with mission, value, strategic business goals, and things that keep clients and their bosses up. I love it. Absolutely. And I'm curious to hear how our non-professor participants have addressed this issue. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, Steve, if you want to unmute people or if you want to invite people to take themselves off mute, we can see about um, having a conversation. And if you want to um, uh, make yourselves visible, fair is fair, we can do it that way too. Um. Sure, let's uh, feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question and to share your video if you wish. Yeah, and if you have a comment to make, feel free to, uh, to offer that as well. You know, the reason I ask that question is I know as external vendors, as perform outside performance consultants, we, also, we often have greater access to sponsorship than people who are internal employees. And we have some folks who uh, do this stuff on a regular basis. And I'm curious to hear what they're thinking about obtaining sponsorship to do this or how they do it. Super. So who's got something to share? We have a question as well from um, Anthony. Uh, John and Daniela, when there are multiple blended solutions to root causes, how do you recommend approaching the task of prioritizing them? Um, so Daniela, as somebody who's been playing in this area in an ongoing way, given the work that you're doing at IHS, do you have a, a point of view about that? And I'm, I'm happy to offer mine as well. Yeah, so um, I would say that um, first we group them in uh, domains of expertise so we can really tackle it from also change management perspective, knowledge management perspective and performance perspective perspective and uh, grouped like that we have subcategories and we use um, we use um, the metrics that uh, John have shown as a model to look at the benefits and effort and um, we have a look at what how how that prioritization works so we combine multiple uh, multiple models and multiple approaches to prioritize them but um, one of the things that um, we started to use a lot this intersection of domains like change management, knowledge management, uh, and performance management. Super. And John, if you want to add to this, or we yeah. go to the next question. Yeah, I, I think I think I love your answer. Um, I'll I'll offer a slightly different cut on this. Um, I I think it's important to 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 have a basis for saying 
um, here's where the here's where the benefit here's where the benefit is likely to be um, based on your evaluation and based on the data that you've gathered and the interpretation of it. Um, I also think there's there's oftentimes there's sequencing issues that need to be addressed that you have to do this piece before you can do that piece. So that may suggest that you don't run um, a couple of blended solutions concurrently, but rather you sequence them in order to take advantage of uh, this, the, the, the leverage and the synergies of the progress that you make along the way. The final thing is that um, as far as the stakeholder management is concerned, not all the stakeholders are necessarily on board at the same time or to the same degree. And so what I also find is being uh, sensitive or attuned to where is their appetite and energy for beginning, given that it isn't so out of sequence as to damage the larger, the larger uh, range of interventions that you're considering is often worth, worth considering. Thank you, John. And I think I would um, add even more because we have a statement from um, Sinclair. Um, it's a follow-up to Tony's question. That's a good question. We get the question a lot from senior leaders. If I can only do 10 things, which 10 things, for example. So I would probably add in addition to prioritization criteria that I have mentioned about the domains and intersection. Um, it and the effort and benefit. You can also look at um, two other things, the maturity of that, uh, where the leaders want to be in three years from now and demonstrate that through certain steps they get there. And the other one is maturity level of the organization for the type of change that you want to do. So these two other components, you can add them in the mix of your uh, prioritization criteria. And, and of course, any time that you're doing prioritizing, you're looking for there to be alignment with um, strategic, strategic intent and whatever the initiatives are of the organization and the longer term view. You, want, you, you certainly don't want to be across purposes with that. Um, other questions or comments? I love the comments, great comments that people are, and you know, questions that people are asking. Oftentimes when um, clients come to us, um, they typically also have a solution in mind and they often have, um, you know, will, uh, well intentioned, but mis often misinformed ideas about what the performance gap is, let alone mm -hmm causes. Uh, and they're also expecting a single magic bullet, typically training. Yep. Um, how do you negotiate uh, that uh, changing their frame of reference so that you can talk about these blended uh, solutions and a systematic approach? So I'll, I'll offer a piece and then Daniela, please. Um, I, it, what you're what you're asking, Steve, brought a smile to my face because it reminds me of a, a long time uh, now deceased colleague of ours, Joe Harless, um, and and uh, Joe 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 had a couple of observations that I think are germane before I actually give you an answer. One of them one of them is is that uh, if this was if this was a doctor's office and you took the patient's advice, you'd be sued for malfeasance because basically you've got, you've got the patient self-prescribing, self-diagnosing and self-prescribing. Now, that, that said, it may be that they're right, but if you were to accept that without doing at least some of the legwork to determine what the heck is going on through your data gathering and your analysis, that that's that's depending much more on the hope technology than it is on the human performance technology. Um, the other, another thing that I would say that Joe shared years and years ago is is that sometimes what you need to do is give people um, 
what they need disguised as what they want. And sometimes they're more enamored of the label than they are, well, it, it isn't really training after all, it's coaching, or it isn't really training after all, it's something else. Sometimes you can finesse that. But um, what, I, what I find is that it's worthwhile to get to know uh, your, your colleague, your, your customer uh, well enough that you can have a candid conversation to find out the why of this. In a way, in a way that they can take a step back and look at it without losing face. I would rather, as a personal bias, I would rather step away from a client demanding a solution that I know is not going to take care of their performance issue, rather than rather than can make things worse by riding the horse down that particular path. Um, it's, it, it seems to me that it becomes a lost leader because you will not have produced the desired result and you will have wasted time and resources and credibility in the bargain. Daniela, what, what, would, what might you uh, offer around this? I would offer um, a, practical, a practical approach with um, what we do in our organization. We, uh, have a checklist with questions that mm. would really uh, try to respond to what that they actually want to fix through the intervention. And um, it's like a diagnosis checklist. And um, <clears throat> it's also connected with uh, the art car change management. Mm -hmm. level, so that we try to, to see what type of changes are happening at the worker, uh, workplace and or organization level. Um, and then it's uh, self um, explanatory when they see the result of that, that it's not only training that it's needed and uh, it, it comes from um, facilitated discussions with them as well. I love that. John, John and Daniela, can I offer a sort of a tertiary comment? Please. Um, uh, when I every time I see that HPI uh, model, one of the things that occurs to me is that um, the change management aspect is ends up being a lim a little limited in my view. It 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 says it happens toward the end, but I think change management starts the very first time you interact with the client or the client organization. Uh, mm -hmm. Anytime you're interacting with somebody, you're influencing how they see the potential outcome. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's the, the slide right before that. Well, okay. Uh, so this is, this is, this is the HP, this is the HPI model. Yeah, I was looking, I was like one of the last slides. Okay. We can do this. I'm glad you can because I'm not sure I could. Oh yeah, see their change management starts with intervention selection design and development. Actually it doesn't. If you take if you take a look, there's arrows going in both directions. So at least the way I read that Tony is that change management is something that's taken into my, taken into account. Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. From the I'm, very I'm sorry. John, I was looking at that gray, that, that large oh, got gray. It. Got it, got it. I see it. Under domains of complexity. Yeah. Under, understand. Yeah. Um, so this was, thank you for the, thank you for the clarification. So this was um, the particular intervention that, that Edie did uh, at, at the Rotman Business School up in Toronto. And so in this particular example, it looks as if she's starting um, further, further down the process than what's indicated at the, at, at the, uh, by change management at the top of the model. Yeah, and I, and I think that a lot of people do that. And, and sometimes that works out. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. And, mm -hmm. and so, and so to, your, to that point, and, and Daniela, I'm wondering, if you have a comment to make in terms of 
the experience that you've had over the years um, around how you work with and weave in um, change management um, concerns and where that, where that starts and how, and what does that look like wherever it does start? It, it starts um, from the beginning, as Anthony says, I, I think more concerted um, efforts for change management is when you start to implement uh, the change and mm -hmm. you have to bring even more um, tools and support ideas to, to move that ahead. Um, and not only when you implement, but also after and the maintenance part. Um, so I find that post implementation has its challenges as well for the change to stick. So um, I think there are levels of uh, change management interventions across. Um, I find very busy from the moment that you start to implement them. You know, something I'd like to hear, John, you and Daniela talk about is that maintenance piece. Steve and I have talked about this in the past, but it seems like by the time you get to, uh, you, you've done your design and development and you even started to implement, it seems like you get this thing tossed over the, the wall at that point. And um, have you found a way to to sell the aspect of maintenance to clients when you've been talking, particularly when you're talking about blended solutions that aren't just necessarily a single thing, but, but maybe multiple parts of a solution. Yeah. Uh, for myself, Tony, um, it's an ongoing, I, I find it an ongoing challenge. Um, and part of it is structural in a couple of different ways. Um, you oftentimes have multiple stakeholders. And so they don't necessarily have the same cares and concerns. Um, you've got different parts of the organization that may be impacted by a blended solution or sequential pieces. You have budgeting cycles that need to be accounted for. Now, I, I happen to be a proponent of being thoughtful and proactive and teeing things up sooner rather than later. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm proponent of creating informed consumers for the work that's there to be done. And so one of the ways that that translates is at least having the conversation so that decision makers know what, what are the light, what are the likely consequences that go along with making this kind of a decision versus that kind of a decision. At the end of the day, regardless of what my professional point of view is, regardless of what my bias is in terms of what the client should, should uh, choose, it's the client's decision. I can, I, I, mm -hmm. I have, to, I have to, I have to own what my own boundary and what my own, um, where, where my ownership stops. I need to be two headed about it in a certain yeah. way. Thank you. Daniela, what about you? Yes, I, I, I agree with what you said. Uh, there are two components that I noticed um, help with uh, the adoption and uh, continuous engagement of the stakeholders. One is related to ownership. If they start to feel that they own whatever you implement, um, they find the structure that would support that. They build a structure. They um, also look at what other support tools they need for their staff to help them uh, move ahead with that imp implementation. So, once they own it, they just run with it. I think. I think. I think. To Daniela's point, being being able to, um, and maybe this is implied by what you're saying, Daniela. Uh, if you have if you have an openness to explore, being being willing and able to co-design something with with the client about how it can work 
So it isn't anything that's imposed from without. The ownership is there, um, tends to have a greater likelihood of sustainability. Um, another perspective I think that can be brought to bear has to do with uh, the implications of letting something fall by the wayside. At, at, which point, at which point performance tends to regress to the mean uh, and go back to business as usual. And then you have the same situation of having something that isn't sustained, that the, there's nothing, there's no, no structures, no processes and no um, routines built into the system to support the change that you're, that you're looking to produce in the first place. So I, d I don't want to hog the, the questions here, but I'd, I'd like to follow up if I could. Um, to what extent do we or should we then, when we're designing a solution, uh, factor in those, the maintenance costs of uh, our solution? And, and, pro and project those costs so that they aren't an afterthought, but are planned in, planned from the beginning. Oh. I just, I don't, I don't have a, a history of seeing that happen. Yeah. Maybe you do. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So um, one way in which uh, we approach that is by creating a, a support model that, um, shows a continuity between the project implementation and post implementation. And that support model um, is what's really made uh, quite a change in people feeling more comfortable to adapt and adopt new things in their you know, workflow of the work. Um, the support model it, um, is mm, more intense in the first six months uh, and less intense after that, but they, they feel that they are supported continuously. Um, and it's for a centralized process that, uh, that we do that. And we can definitely talk about details, but um, that's what changed uh, a lot, how things were accepted in the organization, changing the support model. That's, that's great. Um. I would, I would just, I would just say, I actually, I don't, I don't have to add anything. Steve, you were going to say something. Um, I was going to say that in my experience, uh, implementation, uh, maintenance, and change management are often orphan areas of our practice, um, and because of that one of the tricks I do now in my own practice uh, during project qualification is to start asking questions like, um, what is this gonna look like when we roll it out? How do we make sure it's going to be easy for people to work, uh, work on? Um, how are we going to maintain this? You know, what's the volatility of the information we're using? Uh, you know, how are we going to make sure that this stuff keeps uh, relevant, timely, current, complete? Uh, how are we going to, how will we build so that um, people can add to the knowledge that's already in the system? Um, how will we work in a way that provides for support for adoption and change management from day one? Uh, and I find if I work those questions into uh, project qualification when I have my greatest negotiation uh, uh, vantage point, then um, it's more successful than when I try to raise them later as they may come up in our models. I, I, yeah. Uh, in the same way, I would add evaluation being an orphan. That's the other one. And every, every one of those areas, it seems to me, benefits from being included in the early conversation. Um, I, love, I love what you're saying because you're using that as one of the bases for saying go or no go if I understand you correctly. 
and also of through the conversation of of educating the customer of relevant important issues that though they may not have been on their radar initially according to your professional point of view need to be they need to be factored in is that fair yeah at this point i'm really looking forward to the case study john oh absolutely and, you, know, I'm, and you, you both have done just such a great job talking us through this thank you oh um, thank you yeah thank you both we're running a little over uh, and so I think at this point, it might be good to thank you both again and uh, remind people that part two will be on the same time, same channel uh, next week. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you'll see another announcement shortly. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for your generous and active listening and your participation. And Steve. Tony, thank you very much for uh, your generosity in extending the invitation to us to come, come play in your sandbox for a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. See you, see you next week. And thank all of you for being here. We're now coming to the end of the meeting. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.